Some of the oldest civilizations on Earth have come from India and the... Oh, no. No, no, stop. Go back. Stop. <laughs> right, enough of that. When it comes to India, it's well known that its early modern history was shaped by the involvement of the British. But not many people know that the British weren't the only imperial European power to get involved in the Indian subcontinent in the early modern period. And of course today, I'm going to talk about the Dutch involvement in India. Because the Dutch were involved in India for quite a number of years, as well as the British, although they would obviously give way to the British, who would go on to grant the Indians independence in 1947. But in this video, I want to look at this older and lesser known past. What was the Dutch involvement in India? Why were they there? What did they do? And why did they go away again? Before getting into that, a quick word from today's video sponsor, which is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid for video streaming service with thousands of different documentaries that you can gain access to with a small monthly fee. They cover many different topics like science, nature and history. I'd like to recommend one in particular, which is called India's Lost World. And this is about the side of India that you might not normally see, especially the wildlife side of things and the diverse faces that you might come across in the Indian subcontinent, some of which may have been seen by these Dutch traders and explorers, as I'll talk about in this video, as some elements of India have remained unchanged for centuries and even millennia. So it's a really great watch and you can have access to this and many other documentaries on similar topics by going to Magellan TV. There's even a special offer for viewers of this channel. You can either go to the description or simply type try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert for a free month of premium membership. It's really worth checking out so do check it out because that does help out the channel as well and you can get access to all these great documentaries. But anyway, let's dive into it. When it comes to the Dutch and colonial possessions and international trade, it's Indonesia that is far more well known as a place where the Dutch were both in control and trading as opposed to India, which is normally seen as being just part of the British sphere of influence. However, this was not always the case. For much of the Middle Ages, what is today the Netherlands was under the control of various political entities, although towards the end of this period it became largely consolidated within the Holy Roman Empire. Since 1566, however, many of the Dutch had been in open revolt against their Spanish ruler, Philip II, and eventually sought to create their own independent state. I've got a video about this, about the Eighty Years' War and the Dutch Revolt, if you are interested. At the time, they were suffering largely at the hands of the Spanish and economically they wanted to get back at them and their Portuguese allies. In 1595, the Dutch decided to strike back against the Portuguese exclusion of the Dutch in the spice trade. And an expedition was mounted to Java, which is one of the islands in Indonesia, to Bantam, to trade these spices where they also fought with the Portuguese but eventually made it back. When they did make it back, they made a 400% profit on the goods that they were trading. Within several years, these successes would lead to the creation of the VOC, or the Verenigd Oost-Indische Compagnie. Nederland kan het weer! Die VOC mentaliteit! The VOC was given considerable power by the Dutch government and assembled a fleet that eventually would become larger than the combined fleets of most other European nations at the time for the sole purpose of trading. It also, however, developed an army and a fleet, not just for trading in the peaceable sense, but also for violently taking trade from their opponents. Of course, the main opponents at the time were the Spanish, who since several years had been in a personal union with the Portuguese, and the Portuguese were some of the earliest Europeans to be out and trading in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And so the Dutch set their sights on those Portuguese trading stations that had been established in India, some of them already stretching back to the early 16th century. The first blow fell in 1609 when a swift Dutch assault managed to capture an old Portuguese fort in Pulicat after a few years earlier Dutch sailors had successfully traded with the native inhabitants there. 
This was followed in 1616 by the foundation by Peter van den Broeke on the other coast of India at Surat in the northwest of another trading station, this time not being taken from the Portuguese but founding a new one in its entirety in that region. And in so doing founded the Dutch directorate of Surat, establishing other Dutch trade posts close to Surat itself. In 1627, this was followed by the establishment on the other coast of India of Pipelli, which was another of these Dutch directorates that would grow around the area, particularly being involved in the trade of fabric. And around this time, some 50% of textiles and 80% of silks were transported from Benghalan, which today is Bengal, this region in the northwest of India, or the northeast of India, sorry, to the Dutch Republic, making those traders incredibly wealthy indeed. This was followed in 1656, finally after many years of trying, with the conquest of Ceylon, which today is known as Sri Lanka, over the Portuguese. And from this, they were able to secure the opposite coast in India in 1661, the Malabar Coast as it's called, with the town of Cochin falling to the Dutch in 1661, and thus securing their possession over Ceylon, which they would keep for a long time. In fact, longer than they would keep parts of India, and so I've decided to dedicate a separate video to the Dutch presence in Ceylon, or today's Sri Lanka, which I will link when that is done. The Dutch were a different kind of ruler to the Portuguese, who had often tried to convert the local population, in that the Dutch were far more interested in turning a profit. And actually through the immigration of Dutch settlers, some of whom were Catholic, others of whom were Protestant or Jewish, there was a large amount of religious diversity in many of their settlements and this wasn't something generally that they tried to change. The Dutch also minted coins in several of their sites. This is an example that was minted in Pulikat and what's interesting is that there is a kind of fusion of both Dutch culture and the local Indian culture on there as while this is a Veyose coin that was minted by the Dutch, it shows Lord Venkateshwara who is one of the incarnations of Lord Vishnu who is a Hindu god on there and oftentimes these coins have Sanskrit inscriptions on them although they were used by Dutch and by local traders in these Dutch ports and on Ceylon as well. The Dutch were mainly interested in resources to trade and take back to the Netherlands, such as fabrics and cotton and silk, as well as precious gems that were mined in several of these directorate. Dutch Bengal, for example, also had the capability of producing saltpeter, which they did in large factories while Dutch Coromandel specialised in the making of gunpowder and actually produced so much gunpowder that it supplied most of the VOC fleet that passed through the area on their homeward bound voyages as well as the garrisons of all the Dutch possessions in India and Ceylon as well. All of this was reliant on native labour which was often incredibly exploitative and was actually a lot of the time done by slaves. They also took and traded in slaves in the Indian subcontinent which were there in abundance at the time and sent these to Indonesia to the Spice Islands to work on the plantations there as well as to other parts of what at that point was the Dutch Empire including South Africa. And this actually led to the creation of a new diaspora as what in Dutch are called the Kaapse Malayers, which means the Cape Malays, so people from let's say Malaysia or Malay speaking peoples, also included people from the Indian subcontinent and Sri Lanka today as well and they can still be found in South Africa to this day as a separate identity and a separate group. At its height the Dutch holdings in India looked something like this although it should be noted here that this wasn't really areas under Dutch control so much as these were trading stations often fortified trading stations with factories that were there with the allegiance and the help of local rulers in these areas. These, it should also be said, were independent directories that were part of the VOC rather than all falling under one unified entity called Dutch India. In this video I've called it Dutch India but really these were all independent from Surat and Malabar, Coromandel, Bengal and Sri Lanka or Ceylon as it was called at the time. These all operated independently under the VOC but happened to be in what today is the Indian subcontinent and Sri Lanka, hence why I've grouped them here. Militarily too, they were defended by garrisons and also often went on the assault against the others. We've already seen that they attacked the Portuguese and were able to wrest several of these directorates from Portuguese control, such as at Pulicat. 
and in 1693 as part of the Nine Years' War they also went on the offensive against the French and managed to capture the French trading post of Pondicherry which was in the northeast of the country and were able to hold it until the treaty which ended the war they gave Pondicherry back to the French in exchange for other possessions that had been captured by the French during that war. In many ways this was a last huzzah for the Dutch Republic as a whole and for Dutch India as described as during the 18th century Dutch power would really wane in Europe as opposed to the rising power of Great Britain as it took over the leading role of the Protestant nation in Europe to oppose the French. In 1741 the Dutch were defeated in the Malabar coast by the Travancore king uh, and they really they remained in control of some of these trading stations that they'd established there but really were no longer the dominant power in that area. They were to be followed in 1759 with an eclipsing of their power in Bengal following the British victory at the Battle of Placé over the French and over the Nawab of Bengal. And by this time the Dutch were really falling behind the British and despite their best efforts to defeat the British in battle in 1759 they were humiliatingly defeated by the British and driven out of Bengal. Their support for the fledgling American Republic, whilst the Americans were very grateful for it, led to the disastrous Fourth Anglo-Dutch Sea War which cost the Dutch an awful lot of money and really nulled the death knell for the VOC which would collapse several years later. In 1793 there would be internal trouble within the Dutch Republic itself with the Patriots aligning to revolutionary France that had recently had the French Revolution and were trying to inspire similar revolutions in other European nations. They would force the Dutch Stadthouder into exile and would create the Batavian Republic becoming an ally to the Republic of France and therefore making the Dutch colonial possessions an enemy of Great Britain their erstwhile ally. This led to the Stadthouder signing what became known as the Q Letters from his exile in Q Palace in London. These stated that all Dutch colonial possessions should be taken over by the British to stop them falling into French hands for the day when the Dutch Republic would be reborn and would no longer be under the yoke of the French. Now in 1814 with the British and Allied victory and I might include also the Dutch victory at Waterloo or Waterloo the tables turned once again and the Anglo-Dutch treaty did see that many of these places in India went back to Dutch control but this only lasted around a decade as in 1824 when a second Anglo-Dutch treaty was ratified that said that the Dutch would give over their colonies in India to the British in exchange for other trading rights and other areas of influence in the Spice Islands which were a lot more lucrative to the Dutch at the time and so this basically gave control of the last Dutch areas in India over to the British and is part of the reason why the Dutch role there has largely been forgotten as they were overshadowed and incorporated into what would become the British Raj of India. However, if you know where to look today, you can still see some traces of this Dutch colonial past on the Indian subcontinent. Many of the old Dutch cemeteries have been retained, the most famous of which are in Pulikat as well as some in Dutch Bengal. This is interesting because in Pulikat, for example, thanks to the excellent work of Indian archaeologists and conservationists who have saved many of these graves over the passage of time, and it's interesting because they, instead of showing crosses on them as many Christian cemeteries do, a lot of the time actually have carvings of skeletons on them, which is very interesting. Many of the forts built by the Dutch still exist but most are now in very ruinous conditions due to centuries of decay and abandonment and of the plundering of local people of many of the, the stones that were used for their own building projects. In Bengal there may even be a survival of several Dutch words in the names given to playing cards as many of the Dutch sailors and merchants would play cards with the local inhabitants to the point where having introduced them they retain some of the old Dutch names for playing cards. Ruhitun, Harotun and Ishkapun are the Bangla words for 
what in the Dutch is called Rauten, Harten and Schoppen and it's clear that these have been taken from the Dutch names rather than any other languages names for these elements of the playing cards. Finally, in Cochin a particular type of bread is found that is also found in places that were formerly in the Dutch East Indies as well as on modern day Sri Lanka which is called Broder or something similar and this actually the word potentially comes from the Dutch brood tulbont which was a type of breakfast cake that was a kind of bread that was spiced with nutmeg and ginger and other kind of spices that you know is still eaten today in the Netherlands and that this then contracted to create the name of this bruder kind of thing which is still eaten in Cochin in India today as well as in several other places and this is widely known to have a Dutch origin and to go back to the Dutch colonial time in Cochin and the other parts of their trading empire. So that is the end of this video about the Dutch in India. I hope this has been somewhat interesting as it's something that I didn't know too much about. I know that they'd been there but I wasn't quite sure what their legacy was. Let me know if you'd be interested to see something similar about the Dutch in North America because they have several hidden influences there as well that I think might be quite interesting. Or if you want to see that video on the Dutch in Ceylon then do let me know about that as well. Thank you all very much for watching this one and please do give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below if you knew about Dutch India already or if you'd like to find out a little bit more as well as any random facts that you might have. In the meantime, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.